had a better idea. Hello? Oh, it just went So, hi. I'm Ilana Zaidi. I'm an associate research scholar uh, here at CITP, and my background is in law. Uh, but I bring many other sort of dabbling in other disciplines to the table as well. So I'm very excited to be here. So in this panel, we're going to be talking about sort of ethics in related to cybersecurity research. And I think one really great aspect of this event is that uh, often when you talk about ethics and computer science, it's lumped together as, as if people are considering similar issues and in similar situations in terms of the experiments they run. But this gives us a really great opportunity to try to tease out some of the issues that are different here. So the issues that might come up in, uh, might be more salient uh, sort of in cybersecurity than machine learning, although obviously there is a certain degree of overlap. So uh, my lovely panelists here today, it's uh, Nick Feimster, who's a professor here at CITP. He's the deputy director, if I'm going to get the title. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Pratik Mittal, uh, Mittal is an assistant professor of electrical engineering here. And Ben Zevenbergen is, what is your official title? <laughs> Something. No, he's a very important uh, what, visiting research scholar at CITP. He's very important. He's very important, yes. <laughs> he really is. Uh, so anyhow, uh, so I'm going to... So we're going to go down the line and talk about some case studies to try to make this a little more practical and also reference some of the themes that we've already been talking about. So I'm just going to introduce a few issues that they will then continue to elaborate on. So as I said, one is issue is uh, what is different and what issues come up more in the context of cybersecurity research than other computer science research. Uh, one thing that came up was who are we protecting in terms of the ethics for this? Are we protecting the data subject? Are we protecting future users of the internet? Are we protecting companies, corporate investments, the government? I think there's a real difference in terms of uh, both the goals of the research and who, what the harms people are considering in these different areas. Uh, so again, what kind of harms are we protecting against? And what do you do after the research in this case? How do you share your findings? You know, how public do you make it? Do you go to the company? Do you go to the government? What do you do if you find a flaw? Uh, what is your ethical responsibility there? And what kind of conflicts of interest might there be uh, in terms of uh, pr getting publicity, getting sponsorship, getting a bounty? Uh, and those are all issues that come up here. And with that, uh, Nick will take it away. Thanks, Alana. Can you hear me? Okay, great. So I wanted to, to tackle the questions that Ilana posed to the panel from my perspective. The first was, what are the ethical issues that are particularly salient in cybersecurity research that are, that are different than those that we discussed in the first panel? And I'd like to start by saying that the issues are somewhat overlapping in the sense that many security problems, in particular some of those that, that I've worked on, relate to developing algorithms that depend on gathering large amounts of data and drawing inference from them. So in that sense, the areas of security and machine learning can overlap quite a bit. There's some cases w then where I think many of the, the questions that come up are similar. So uh, I'll relate uh, a couple of, of, of cases or uh, anecdotes, if you will. Uh, and, and one involves the IRB, uh, which I think will t also tie back to the first panel. So many years ago, I worked on spam filtering. And the, the gist of the research basically was to uh, essentially look at network traffic patterns, uh, send rates, where traffic is coming from, going to, what times of day it's being sent, et cetera, et cetera, to try to tease apart uh, the behavior of spammers from the, that of legitimate email senders. And this essentially boils down to a, an inference or machine learning problem uh, that depends on having a corpus of uh, you know, large amounts of, of traffic. Now, as I think many of us know, Gathering corpuses uh, of spam is actually pretty easy. You pretty much get it whether you want it or not. Um, <laughs> as it turns out, when you want when you want a certain type of spam, it actually is a lot harder than than it than it seems, unfortunately. But um, but uh, but actually, one of the, the tricky things, of course, as with any inference algorithm, is that um, that you like to have good labeled data for both for both cases, the spam and the legitimate mail. So when we were doing this kind of work. 
we actually, the bigger challenge actually was getting good data for the legitimate mail. Uh, the first place you want to go then, of course, is um, people's inboxes. Um, now, at the time I was a, a researcher at, at, uh, at Georgia Tech, and uh, I was on the faculty there, we were doing, doing this work there, and uh, we went to the IRB with this problem, thinking that basically we could um, you know, talk to them about ways to get uh, corpuses of, of legitimate mail. Keep in mind that the whole nature of our research was actually not to look at payload, but actually to see whether or not we could solve this problem just by looking at traffic patterns, right? So we didn't need to look at people's email or, or, or the text of it, if you will. All we needed were examples of sending patterns from emails that were known to be good, right? So we weren't trying to be particularly invasive. We just needed basically uh, traffic patterns of, of email that was known to be good. Now, when we went to the IRB, uh, to discuss this, we got a particularly interesting uh, and I would say troubling uh, analysis, uh, which kind of I think relates to some of what, um, what, what we talked about in the first panel. They said, oh, um, okay, well, if, if you need to, uh, to, to get access to the email inboxes of you know, students or users on, on the campus, that's probably, you know, that's a little problematic. Um, and I think that's the answer that we would expect. Um, so that, that's in some ways comforting. Then we said, well, also we do have this ability to take packet capture from, you know, from, the, uh, from the router that's sitting at the, the border between the computer science department and the rest of campus. And of course, uh, you know, we could see full packet capture from there. Um, can we, what can we do there? And they said, oh, well, um, yeah, that's okay. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of no reasonable expectation of privacy. You know, people, when they, when they basically join the campus network, they sign away their, their, their expectations, and they should be expect to be wiretapped, essentially. <laughs> um, and it was sort of like a very strange uh, analysis because uh, obviously you can get the same data from, from both sources, right? In fact, the, the, the latter, uh, you can see a lot more. Um, but it was, it was based on sort of a, um, I would say, um, per perhaps it, it was an analysis that was based on a very poor understanding of the, of the technical capabilities of, of what, we were, what we were trying to do. Um, in the end, we went, we went with neither. Um, I can finish that story later uh, if people are interested. But, but I think that was a case where, um, you, you know, again, um, the, another case where just going to the IRB looking for a, ch a check mark is, is certainly not going to be the end of the story because, in, in fact, sometimes the analysis is exactly wrong. Um, so another case where, where data, um, uh, you know, in, in, in statistics and, and machine learning come up is, is, is internet censorship measurement. And again, this only works basically when you have large amounts of data. It's another topic that I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, but again, overlap between security and, and machine learning comes up there again. Uh, your question was, you know, where are the, you know, the ethical considerations different? And I think there are, there are sort, of th sort of three classes of security research where things are a little bit different. One is where security researchers operate as an adversary, right? So sometimes we hear of this as white hat hacking, right? So this are, you know, cases where researchers are hacking systems, um, whether that be software or devices or cars or what have you, um, in an attempt to discover vulnerabilities. And, and then I think there are questions of disclosure. I think I'll leave uh, that to the broader panel discussion, but uh, that's a question of, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, questions of ethical and legal hacking. Uh, when you discover a vulnerability, what are the ethics of disclosure, et cetera? So that's one area is uh, researchers operating as an adversary. The second is operating in realms so the, se the second and third, I think, are a little more subtle. Um, the second is operating uh, in, in, as a researcher in realms where there is an adversary, right? So this, I think, basically, you could classify things like research on internet censorship into this area. And this might be measurement of internet censorship, right? Where by inherently, you know, measuring the, the, the behavior or the nature of what's going on in a particular country, you may be putting citizens or users at risk. Um, another case might be the design of censorship systems themselves, right? So another case that comes up is, you know, uh, a lot of people have 
try to analyze the, the behavior of users on, on Tor, uh, also the behavior of Tor itself. I'll, I imagine Pratik will talk about that. So I'll leave that uh, a little bit more to the panel as well. But that's a second area, is research where there is an adversary. And there, I think, a lot of the, the ethical questions center around risk, risk to users uh, and, and other participants. And then finally, I think this is a, a, you know, perhaps a, a, you know, the most subtle, is um, research as system designers where we must consider how our systems might be misused by adversaries. Okay, and um, I'll give you an example. Um, and I think this is one that might not be immediately obvious on, on its face, uh, but, but, um, but I think once the issue surfaces, it becomes quite apparent. So there was a paper, I think, in, in SIGCOM two years ago that um, there were a couple different papers on the topic, actually, that basically uh, were the design of systems that would uh, allow uh, internet service providers to essentially launch man-in-the-middle attacks on their subscribers' traffic and uh, with the sort of intended positive outcome of being able to do things like transcoding or compression or other types of performance optimizations. And you'll hear this, I think, from you know, certain telecom providers, et cetera, to say, you know, the types of things that we want to do in our networks are becoming increasingly hard because of end-to-end -end encryption. Like, we can't compress a video stream because we don't know what's in there, right? So these systems then were an attempted answer to that to say, oh, yes, we want to basically design systems that make it easier for the ISPs to see this traffic so that they can do good things. But I think, you know, just by the nature of how I framed that, I think it's, it's pretty clear that those systems could be misused in, in, in very bad ways, right? I mean, in the worst case scenario, we could see a situation where the ISP gives the user a choice of, you will let us you know, escrow your keys so that we can man in the middle of your traffic or no internet service for you. So I, I think that's a, a third area where we have to be considering the ethics, where as system designers, um, we can think of basically how this system might be used for good, but as well, you know, how it may be misused. And I think we see that conversation come up a lot in systems like Tor and systems where the inherent, you know, there's always the claimed good use, but people are very quick to jump on the, you know, sort of potential misuses of those. I think it often is less obvious in, in other cases where the system is framed, you know, not in, a, in, a, in an anonymity context, but in some other context. Hey, this is going to be good for network management, but hey, wait a minute, let's back up here. Are there other bad uses for those kinds of systems? And I think that definitely deserves, deserves more attention. Sure. Yeah, th thanks, Alana and Nick. Uh, let me begin by first mentioning that I'm not an ethicist. Uh, my research is in computer security and privacy. Uh, and through this research, I have uh, intersected with many interesting ethical and uh, uh, legal issues and challenges that I, that I hope to discuss through, through some, of, uh, some of my work. Uh, one of my particular interests is designing systems that protect the privacy of users in their online communication. So this is along the lines of the Tor network that Nick mentioned. Uh, systems for anonymous communication aim to protect user identity, which is typically our IP address, uh, either from uh, the recipient or from third parties on the internet, such as internet service providers. Uh, Tor is a widely used and a widely deployed system. It comprises of roughly uh, 7,000 proxy servers that are geographically distributed in the internet, uh, roughly 2 million users who, who use this network, including journalists, whistleblowers, uh, businesses, law enforcement, intelligence agencies, uh, and even ordinary citizens. So this network, for example, was, was widely used to uh, evade uh, censorship in the events of the Arab Spring. The question that uh, I want to talk about today is how we can conduct uh, security research on the Tor network while protecting the safety of Tor users. So just to provide some context on the security research on the Tor network, uh, it, it is well known in the research community that Tor is not a perfect system. So in particular, if you are a network level adversary, such as uh, 
AT&T or, or Comcast, and you get to see traffic uh, going into the Tor network, and you get to see traffic coming out of the Tor network, then you can do what is known as a timing analysis attack and compromise the privacy of Tor users. So at Princeton, so in fact, this was amongst the first projects uh, that I pursued uh, when I joined in 2013, we were interested to see if somebody who's not automatically observing this traffic, can that adversary exploit weaknesses and vulnerabilities in internet routing to be in a position to observe user traffic and then use that position to compromise Taurus privacy? Of course, this raises significant uh, ethical conundrums because Tor is a deployed system. In fact, Tor users are particularly concerned about the privacy of their online communications. It's, it's evident in their, use of, in their use of the Tor network. On the other hand, from a scientific perspective, this is an extremely important question to think about because it's only when we understand the true capabilities of these types of adversaries can we reason about the fundamental limits of uh, privacy and anonymity that systems like Tor can, uh, can, can provide. Uh, so let me articulate uh, some steps that we took uh, to conduct this research uh, that tried to balance uh, the security questions that we were interested in versus uh, the, the ethical challenges. So our first principle was not to attack third-party infrastructure. Uh, so in particular, we inserted our own Tor relays that we hosted at Princeton University, and we attacked our own Tor infrastructure. The second principle was we chose not to attack the real traffic of Tor clients, but instead we fielded our own Tor, Tor clients that generated fake traffic and chose to attack our own, our own traffic. Uh, we felt this was a reasonable trade-off between uh, the types of questions that we were interested in studying uh, versus, versus the ethical uh, considerations. So because uh, we attacked our own Tor relay, we own the IP address space for that relay. So we were able to collaborate with other autonomous systems and launch real-world BGP hijacking attacks against that prefix, but that's okay because we already owned that prefix. Likewise, we were able to attack the Tor traffic that we generated, but that's also okay because that's, that's, our, own, that's our own traffic. Uh, so through some of these steps and careful experimental design, we were able to uh, get an estimate of how vulnerable the Tor network is to these types of uh, routing attacks and sidestep some of the, some of the more uh, thorny issues. Uh, however, there, there is a cost to this type of an experimental design. Uh, the cost is in terms of the accuracy of the scientific questions that we were studying. So how do we know that our own infrastructure that we injected into the Tor network uh, properly mimics the properties of the true, uh, true Tor relays. How do we know that the traffic that our own Tor clients are generating mimics the behavior of the real uh, Tor, Tor clients? So we, we open ourselves to some criticism about the scientific validity of our, of our results because we chose to uh, conduct this research in, a, in an ethical fashion. Uh, so this, this broadly raises uh, interesting questions that Nick alluded to. How can we, how can we perform uh, some you know, really sensitive measurements on, on, on Tor using real data, but at the same time protecting the privacy of, of users? So I want to highlight an interesting recent development in the community that also relates to a comment that Matt made in the, in the previous uh, panel about how these types of challenges are a research opportunity for the community. So, of course, again, you know, a tremendous interest uh, in the scientific community to understand the behavior of the Tor network. Uh, where are these clients coming from? Who is using Tor? Where are these clients going to? Uh, what does the average bandwidth of Tor relays look like? And so on. Uh, and of course, one approach is to uh, launch your own uh, Tor relay and turn on a network monitoring switch on that relay such that you simply uh, record data of, of uh, real users and record real traffic and, and, and study that. And some researchers have certainly done that. But it, it raises some uh, interesting uh, concerns about the uh, privacy of those users. Uh, and this, this approach is largely discouraged in the, in the community. So there's been some recent developments in the field of uh, applied cryptography and statistical privacy. So in particular, there's this idea called differential privacy, which allows us to obtain aggregate measurements about a data set with a formal and provable mathematical guarantee that the result that you got would roughly be the same if an individual user's data was removed from the data set. Right? Thus, it, it sort of approximates this opt-out mechanism that we often see in the, in the real life. So together, by applying these concepts from differential privacy in conjunction with some other applied cryptographic techniques, the Tor project has been able to obtain interesting statistics uh, 
uh, without compromising the privacy of users. So this is a, this is a deployed system in the Tor network. Uh, I want to uh, I'll make this short. So I want to conclude by saying that, that some of these uh, concepts are not limited to the Tor network alone. So in particular, this idea of differential privacy is is uh, extremely widely applicable. So very recently, the security team at Google was interested in understanding the behavior of Chrome users' default home pages. So what fraction of Chrome users have their default page to be uh, NewYorkTimes.com versus Facebook.com. And uh, th this had genuine implications for configuring uh, their security systems. But of course, directly collecting this data from, from Chrome would, would compromise user privacy. Uh, so again, Google deployed this technology called, uh, called differential privacy through which they're obtaining a very noisy encoding of your home page. That encoding is so noisy that just by looking at that noisy encoding, one cannot make any inferences about which home pages you were using. But by aggregating these statistics from millions and millions of Chrome users, Google is able to obtain a pretty accurate estimate of the, of the overall distribution. So just, so just to sum up, lo lots of exciting challenges at the intersection of uh, security and ethics that conventional uh, institutions like IRB are not, not well equipped to deal with. Uh, there are some things that we as security researchers can do in terms of shaping up our experimental uh, setup and design to balance these, uh, the, this tension between uh, the scientific questions that we aim to pursue and, and the ethical conundrums. Uh, lots of exciting opportunities also to treat this as a research problem uh, and, and, and use uh, advanced uh, security and privacy technologies to obtain the scientific outcome uh, while, uh, while not compromising uh, user privacy. But of course, uh, one thing I didn't talk about was that there, there are going to be some situations in which we will have to trade off potential benefit to users uh, versus potential harm to the system. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll leave it to Ben because I think he has an ethical framework to describe these conundrums. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, in this talk, I didn't want to describe this ethical framework and where it comes from and why it's important again because I've done that several times. <laughs> I don't want to sign loud myself with my colleagues out, uh, by being boring to them. Um, so, but what I wanted to do is do a bit of a reactionary talk, just about some of the things that I heard here and just reflect on them briefly. Um, but just to really briefly tell you where I come from. So I'm a lawyer. Uh, I was working at one of these high-tech firms, high-tech law firms. Uh, and then I went into politics, um, also working in internet law. And what I saw was that lawyers and politicians don't have much knowledge of technology. So when they're trying to regulate, they're always going to be behind because technology moves so quickly and we're just grappling with legal concepts and societal uh, theories about how they should be regulated without actually understanding what's going on there. So um, the, I, I felt the disconnect was too big there to, to have any sort of impact on, um, on sort of the, the ethical governance of, of new technologies. So I went to academia and um, I've been at, at a few sort of interdisciplinary departments and I still find that in academia there is a huge disconnect, but it's, uh, it is a space where you can talk about this disconnect. And I think today is a perfect example of us doing that. Uh, and I, I've now come to the CITP because in my experience of having several of these departments, um, or having seen several of these, that this is really the space where this conversation is happening at the highest level, where there's interest from all sides of the debate, from the technologists and the lawyers and the philosophers, to really get down to understanding uh, how to think about the overlap, how to think about the research problems that you, you just posed. Um, so I, I don't actually have that much experience in the security field. I, I came in a few years ago uh, in the internet measurement space, sort of through Nick and uh, many other colleagues, to start working on ethical standards for that particular community. But I did learn a lot from the security um, ethics conversation because that happened a few years before I started getting interested in this. Uh, and what is interesting there is that they, at conferences, they have sessions about ethics. Um, they have uh, keynotes about ethics at their conferences. Uh, interesting, I, I was one of those keynotes two years, uh, one year ago in Germany, big uh, information security conference. I was the first speaker. Um, and what, what I noticed, what, what I didn't see in other conferences, usually ethics is something that's kind of tucked at the end of a conference. Here it was the first talk. My name was on the screen flashing. <laughs> I was introduced as you know, the guy who's going to solve the ethical problems for the, for the security. Not true, obviously. But, um, <laughs> um, but, but what I found really interesting there is that I did feel like a celebrity for two days with these uh, security researchers who 
kept coming to me, buying me drinks. <laughs> but then what I did also notice, because I thought this was the community that understood ethics, far from it, um, they would come to me and say things like, you know, okay, so how do I make this ethical? And, <laughs> and then, this, yeah, then you hear the story of, you know, we can at any moment control about 10,000 uh, Uber cars in any city, so cause complete congestion. How do you make this ethical? <laughs> uh, because they've done, so, uh, the long story. Okay. But <laughs> that, that's, so that's not the point of ethics. Like, it, it's not something you tack on at the end. It's not where you create something uh, that has huge effects and then it's like, okay, so now the ethics chapter, or you know, the, the 10 sentences about ethics, tell us what to write. It's, it's really a, 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 a thing to think about from the start. Um, and to realize that computer science, as Arvind said brilliantly at the beginning, has really gone from sort of, to paraphrase, to, from technical challenges to a really a social uh, problem or something that's really ingrained in our society. So whatever you do with technology now will likely have some social and political effects and therefore ethical considerations are important. Um, so I would like to now react on a few things that we've heard uh, rather than going through the things that I, I usually say. Um, Matt talked about the principle-based approach, uh, which I think is very interesting, much better than a compliance-based approach, uh, where you know I come in and say, well, you know, you haven't thought about privacy, so someone adds a privacy-enhancing technology, and then they've thought about privacy. Um, what what I usually do with communities that I work with is ask them what their principles are, ask them what their values are, and then go for a more positive approach and say, like, you know, okay, if privacy is indeed one of your values. How can we see that in your design? You know, how are you actually enabling privacy? What are you doing for the communities to, to actually have some form of privacy? And is that privacy meaningful for these communities? Or is it just you know, your average definition of privacy? Um, and the way, the way I found that this, these kind of approaches work best is through an iterative conversation. And this is actually a word that Nick came up with uh, at a conference a year and a half ago in London. But this is iterative design methodology where um, and I, I can share the guidelines that I've been working on with you later, but uh, what we really try to do there is guide the conversation between ethicists and computer scientists um, to understand from both sides what it is that you're trying to achieve, uh, which questions should you be asking. Um, um, so yeah, compliance I think is really the wrong approach for this. It, it may work well for medical ethics, it doesn't for computer science, uh, I find. Um, so then I have a, a whole list of notes here. I'll just go through them quickly. Um, it, Nick mentioned uh, censorship. Uh, uh, I've, I've seen some other research also in the machine learning space where it's kind of about naming and shaming bad actors. And I always raise the question of, you know, what are you actually doing? Are you doing academic research? Like, are you trying to describe a phenomenon? Or are you trying to um, be v vigilante? You know, are you trying to call people out? Are you trying to uh, you know, ensure human rights for a particular community? It's very valid to do so, but it's, you've got to ask yourself the question, what it is exactly that you're doing, and is it actually academic research that you're doing? Uh, in that case, you know, academic uh, research frameworks will apply to you. In other cases, it may not, but you could easily reconfigure the, the, the question or the, the, the theme or the point that you're working on to make it academic and to then engage in the academic research conversation. Otherwise, sometimes you can also think about uh, spending some time doing activist research or consumer research. Uh, they have different ethical frameworks, uh, and it's fine to do so. Um, uh, about the, the power position that uh, YouTube's spoken about, especially within Tor, um, this is also really important to understand as a computer scientist that you are changing environments for people, you're changing information flows, you're changing the data that is known about people and that could be disseminated. So you do indeed have a lot of power. Um, and what you need to do there is obviously take responsibility, but you, by understanding the risks, you need to, um, you need to identify those risks. But before you can identify them, before you can actually like, go to the communities that will be affected by these systems, you have to define them first. And that is often a big problem because if you define the risks for, say, censorship measurement in the US, they're going to be very different than uh, in China, for example. The, the, the risk to you know, the, the Chinese Ben using 
uh, these things, but he, completely different framework of, uh, of, of risks that, that they run into. Um, so one of the things that Barbara mentioned was on um, teaching ethics, and what I also heard about was about community ethics. Uh, and I think I'd, I'd like to raise a couple of points there as well. Um, so what I found interesting in engaging with computer science communities is that there is a definite will to set community standards. Uh, and we, we've seen it in the measurement community, and we've seen it in a few other, that it actually, if you get down to it at conferences, it does work. If you have long conversations about it, if you start writing about it, if you share precedents, it does actually work. Uh, you need to agree on some community standards. It, uh, it's good to have some example case studies. Uh, it's good to have uh, separate sessions at conferences. They can be at the end or they can be the keynote at the beginning. But you know, sort of but the, the important thing is to kind of raise the status of talking about the social consequences of the particular technologies you're talking about at the conference. Um, actually make it a thing that um, the young people you know, the, who have to publish a lot would like to come to. What we did at the ACM SIGCOM conferences, we had some of these uh, inventors of the internet join the session, uh, which really pulled in a lot of other people to come. And they, they had a lot to say there. Um, so yeah, that really raised the status. Um, a thing that Nick and I have been thinking about was creating a database for, um, for ethics considerations at conferences. It, it was raised earlier before as well. Um, program committees have the power of uh, thinking about ethics every single year, year in, year out. But these program committees change, and it's usually five, six people at one of these co uh, for a conference. <coughs> they have personal opinions, and they ha it's a one-stop uh, or one-moment uh, reflection. You get a bunch of papers, and you, you, you can reject a few based on your personal ethics grounds. There's no conversation happening. Um, so what would be interesting there is to uh, set up a database where conversations between you know, ethically dubious papers and the PCs or the IRBs are stored to set a precedent to refer to. So say that you know, the, the uh, ACM SIGCOM conference rejects a paper in 2014, but then through conversation, you know, through understanding the, how to protect privacy better in a particular example, for example, um, you can show that the conversation between the PC and the researchers actually yielded a solution to that ethical problem. That would then be stored. And if you have a similar problem two years later, you can refer to that. And you can say, you know, th this is the community standard that was set then. It's not just forgotten every year. Time for a few more points. Um, another thing about the longitudinal research and the massive data collections and a sort of you know, seeing what happens approach um, or seeing what research questions you can ask when, once you have the data, that's great to some extent, but it's also often misused. Uh, just an sort of anecdote from a conference I was at a few years ago, ACM KDD, Knowledge through uh, database discovery, I think. Um, really interesting. I, I got to present about ethics there as well, but I, I wasn't the keynote. But there were 12 keynotes. Six of them uh, said to all the 3,000 data scientists in the room, uh, you know, thank you for all your work on correlations, but stop. <laughs> we, <laughs> it's, it, it makes no more sense to us. Uh, you know, and these were the head of Microsoft Research and, and uh, head of data for New York City Council. But you know, they said it, it's just become pointless. Like, we've exhausted all the interesting correlations now. If you want to get to an interesting correlation, go work with qualitative researchers, anthropologists, uh, lawyers, and ethicists who really understand what it means, that what questions you're asking, what data you're collecting, what you're comparing. Um, and they've even said that because they had this belief in data scientists, some of their actions would have been based on the, on the recommendations by the data scientists, and they often found that actually it was very counterproductive. Um, so I, I, I think the point I really want to make there is if you have these longitudinal data collections or if, if you're going to ask questions later, really try and understand what it is that you're actually doing, uh, understand what the data is that you're collecting, and understand what it means if that data would be breached, what, what would be the effect of, uh, on, on humans. Um, and I think a final point I would like to make, actually two final points. Um, it sounds like Pratik, I know he didn't, but it sounds like he did use these guidelines that we've been setting up for a while, because this is exactly what we're trying to get to. Um, the 
creative and sort of critical thinking of your own approach, or critical thinking of the approach, and then the creative solutions to get to very similar research outcomes where you've minimized harms. So you know, if, if indeed you can collect all this data and you can answer your research questions easily, great, but you're going to run into a lot of ethical issues there. If you can come up creatively with limiting the scope or thinking of different technological solutions to get to very similar outcomes, that's exactly what we're trying to achieve there. And you asked what's different between the fields. <laughs> uh, the anecdote from that conference in Germany again, um, the, the other keynote speaker came to me, uh, gave me a beer and said, very nice you talk on ethics, but you have to understand um, math, mathematics is pure, it flows directly from nature, information security is mathematics, so there's no place for ethics or any human involvement there, <laughs> of wishy-washy human involvement. And um, he was very convincing, and it took me a while. <laughs> or let's say he was a, you know, a Russian guy, gave me a strong hand. <laughs> we, 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 talk, we talked for hours, uh, and I think, I think I got him to agree that there is actually a place for ethics. Uh, and I hope you agree that as well. Super. So I'm going to open it to questions in a second, but just to kind of go quickly down, and perhaps, Ben, you've just kind of given your answer for this, but Nick and Pratik. So in terms of looking forwards, right, uh, there have been a couple different kinds of solutions discussed, sort of experimental design, privacy-enhancing technologies, uh, technologies allowing you to simulate things in different ways. Uh, uh, we've talked about having essentially professional standards or databases that record instances that people can use, either voluntarily or through some sort of social slash institutional pressure. Um, and then perhaps the idea of something like publishing standards. Uh, you know, in some, in some uh, disciplines, people have to discuss the ethical considerations that were raised or the problems they solved or even conflict of interests uh, that occur. So do you see any particular ways forward that you think are more promising than others or you know, people here who are watching or in this room who want to do something? Uh, do you have any thoughts? Other? Me. I, I can go first sure. here. Uh, so perhaps uh, this is due to the bias from my technical perspective. I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, what, what technology can do to address some of these ethical challenges. So I gave this example of how uh, techniques from differential privacy and secure multi-party computation uh, can achieve uh, a nice balance between uh, ethical considerations and, and the need, uh, need for data analytics and data science. Uh, so over the next five to 10 years, I hope to see uh, more deployment uh, of, of these types of technologies, uh, not just in computer security uh, research, but more broadly uh, computer science, and even, even beyond computer science. So I think Matt pointed out a lot of these interesting challenges exist even in social science research. Uh, I'm also a big fan of uh, community norms, so I think uh, Ben hinted at, at, at some of these issues that uh, there's, there's quite a bit of knowledge in the program committee, but that, that's lost because either the papers are rejected and nobody quite knows why, uh, or perhaps uh, the right set of papers are chosen, but uh, the, re the reason behind why they were chosen is, is, is also lost. Uh, so one, uh, one recent development I'm seeing in, in the computer security and privacy space is that it's, it's now become very common to have a dedicated section called ethical considerations as part of the main body of the paper. So certainly for papers that get accepted, now there's, uh, it's, it's extremely valuable from a pedagogical perspective to the entire community to see through the thought process that the authors had, right? Going back to Ben's comment on critical thinking, uh, what were uh, the, the considerations that the authors were most worried about? What steps did they take to minimize the harm? In spite of those steps, what is the remaining harm to, uh, to potential end users? I'm also a big fan of uh, the third party review mechanism that, that Matt suggested. So, so I just wanted to mention that uh, the Thor project took a lead in setting up something similar. So they came up with this idea of uh, Thor ethics slash safety board. I think several CITP researchers are part of this panel. Perhaps I think Philip Winter comes to mind. Maybe Nick is, is part of that. Uh, uh, and, and that's also a great, a great mechanism where uh, uh, the community members who are new to engaging with, uh, with these types of systems, they can uh, essentially hold some, uh, some more uh, formal office hours with, this, with the safety board and, and benefit from the feedback. Great. I wanted to comment a little bit on two points. One is the, the discussion we're having about norms and professional standards, and the other is on the data minimization. Uh, so first on establishing norms, I think uh, I found actually Matt Solganik's chapter on, on ethics in his, in his book 
extremely enlightening in this regard. And I think one of the things that he says in that chapter that was an aha moment for me uh, that we talked about a little bit on this panel was the importance of involving outsiders in the process of evaluating uh, the ethics and the norms. And I think, um, you know, reading that coupled with um, Craig Partridge and Mark Allman's piece in, in ACM recently on the importance of, of discussing ethics in the papers, I think sort of uh, fed a little bit the idea that, that Ben talked about uh, with regard to should we have um, you know, database or discussion forum where there is institutional memory about uh, these, you know, these decisions that, that are being made and, and, the, and the judgments that, that, um, that eventually uh, transpire. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, I think at uh, this ACM SIGCOM business meeting, maybe it was one or two years ago, uh, I, um, some of you may know, I, was, I wrote a paper on censorship measurement that um, probably got me a little bit into this area. I sort of un unwillingly became a, uh, an ethics, um, you know, um, commenter. I won't claim to be an expert. Um, but, you know, I, I raised this issue at the, at the, you know, process at the SIGCOM business meeting, and the chair of, of SIGCOM said, yeah, we think we have this process. Like, we'll just have the program committee kind of, you know, review this stuff, and if they can't come to an agreement, we'll just kick it up to the ACM. And I, I thought, well, this is kind of, you know, terrible um, <laughs> because you're taking people who kind of know, you know, at least something about the technology and maybe not so much about the ethics, and then you're kicking it up to another review board that knows nothing about the technology, at least not about the specifics, and also nothing about the ethics. So I, th I think, um, you know, I, th I think Matt's uh, proposal to basically involve outsiders in the process really, really important. Um, as we consider the design of, of, of the process for how we establish norms. Um, I think on that point too, um, you know, as, as there are discussions that are, that are going on, I think it's, it's sort of important to have, um, to, to sort of take a broad view of, of, of inputs and stakeholders in these, in these discussions. And I think in, with our case studies that, that you often consider, Ben, in, in your workshops and, and, and such, it's, it's important to have uh, the technical researchers there, um, you know, um, uh, the folks who've been working on censorship measurement, the folks who've been working on the underground economy, you know, the spam and scam economy, the, you know, the, the, the people who are doing white hat hacking, they need to be on those, uh, in, you know, in those discussions, but also we need the, we need the outsiders, right, because, you know, we may be very, we're probably the, the, the best equipped people to judge the technical ins and outs of what's going on, the mechanisms and the alternatives, right? You want to answer this question, well, you know, if we're going to reach alternatives, we need to know it's technically feasible. But I think we're also exactly the wrong people to be judging the, you know, do the risks outweigh the benefits. And I think that's exactly the point Matt, Matt makes in his book, and I, I think it's a really important one. Um, the other thing that I think is, is really important about, about what he's had to say on this topic is that is the, the, the importance of the principles-based approach. I mean, I think too often, I've, I've been on program committees where these discussions happen, and they are, they are based a lot on gut uh, and not on principles. And I think this also uh, harkens back to Pratik's point about the ethical considerations. So quick anecdote there. Uh, the first uh, draft of our internet censorship measurement paper uh, actually had an ethical consideration section in it. And, um, you know, two years later, I asked the, the student who basically did a lot of the work if he'd sort of learned anything from, from the whole process and what, what he sort of took away from, from the whole ethics side of things. And he's, he sort of made a tongue-in-cheek comment, which was that, well, probably we just shouldn't have had an ethical consideration <laughs> section in our paper in the first place because that just pointed out to the reviewers that there were ethical considerations to be had. And I think, that, you know, it was sort of half joking, but I think he has a point, which is that that has to be a standard because if you have, and, and it also should be principles based, not based on gut, right? Because if you have some papers doing that and some papers not, then you have examples like the MCTLS paper or the papers that are doing man in the middle consider it. They don't bring up uh, ethical considerations in their paper. And then it's just a question of do the reviewers think of it or not, right? So you don't want to end up in that situation. And now on the other hand, I think, 
if you just th uh, you know if you just have a, th uh, a section but but there is no opportunity for commentary then we don't get to see the discussion that ensues we d we don't get norms we just see the ultimate outcome of you know this oh this paper didn't make it and we did, we actually have no idea whether that paper didn't make it on technical grounds or because there were actually ethical you know uh, considerations that came up that needed to be addressed so I think that's where I think um, you know Ben's idea for having this sort of ongoing forum et cetera where we can have principles-based discussions uh, is, is really, really critical for establishing those norms. Second um, thing I wanted to mention is a quicker point on data minimization and privacy-enhancing technology. And um, really important, I think, area as well. Um, ben, I think you raised this point of, um, you know, a common practice is yeah, let's just gather a bunch of data and then we'll see if there's anything interesting in it later. And I think that probably 10 years ago was the norm in the internet measurement community. Uh, also, I think um, in general, it, it probably remains the norm for a, a lot of network operations. And, and um, I think that reflects a little bit of like technical immaturity in the field as well, just not knowing how to answer or frame the right questions. Right? Because if you, if you know the right questions, you can think hard about what data you need and, and don't. But I think basically um, the discussion we're having here, I think, will be really important not only for ethics, but also to, it, it will probably improve the science, right? Because uh, we shouldn't be doing our research that way. Like, let's see what data sets fall in our lap and then figure out what questions we want to answer later. That's just, I, I don't think, the way we should be doing, doing our science. But, but it has been the norm for some time. And, I think that'll go away uh, eventually. Um, I think also another thing to pay attention to there, um, which is really exciting, is that the technology itself may help shape some of these data minimization discussions going forward. So two examples there. One is there's a group in the IETF called um, DPRIVE, or it's sort of DNS privacy, and they're working on things like DNS query minimization. Not to get into all the details there, but um, you know, the operators of certain DNS servers can basically see the full DNS name, the domain name that gets looked up, and there are um, obviously um, there are many, many cases where that doesn't need to be seen, right? So that's an example where a design of technology might actually Im sort of minimize the data that's collected without Im Im necessarily impacting the operations or even some of the research questions that we want to study. And then finally, um, I think one of the reasons that we've found ourselves in this conundrum in internet measurement is that the internet measurement technology is really bad. Uh, you know, when we consider that the state-of-the-art tools that we're using are like, let's send a packet here and like see what comes back and you know, how long is that going to take? Or if we're talking about passive traffic capture, really the state-of-the-art is let's just grab everything and, and then look at it later. And, and that's often not because we, you know, it's a little bit cart and horse, right? Is it the researchers aren't answer, asking the right questions for, or is it because the collection technology is so bad that we have to do it that way? And I think that's about to change. I think now, I think there's some really exciting uh, research going on here. Jen Rexford and others are, uh, some of my own students are working on things like query-driven data collection, right? So don't just grab everything. Ask the query first. Right? and then use that query to drive the, the data that actually gets collected. And that actually just hasn't been possible because routers and switches haven't supported that kind of functionality, but, but that's changing. So I think the technology also, we're going to see some promising developments on data minimization. So Ben, you had some say? Yes, you, uh, keep it short because we want to have enough time Very short on, on education, like moving forward on education. Um, so I agree with Pratik. Like, I'm, I'm also a really big fan of technology. Um, but I think that kind of shows also that it's important to get outsiders into uh, maybe also the classroom uh, or at least outside that there is because what you often see is in a computer science course or in a you know technology law course uh, people are it's, it's, it's an echo chamber and people have the same kind of ideas about what they can achieve with their technologies why it's important why it's amazing what they're doing uh, where they're gonna go so it's, it's important to really reflect on the assumptions uh, that you have as you're learning to use these legal or te technological tools. And w one thing that I find really useful there is generating case studies that actually speak to uh, practice, speak to reality, 
you know, ethical case studies with certain dilemmas in there. And one thing I want to warn for is uh, often people use the trolley problem for the self-driving car. You know, how, how, how should you program a car if you either hit a granny or uh, a lady with her child? You know, th that's not something that any programmer is working on at all uh, with self-driving cars. So it's a nonsense uh, dilemma. It's interesting to get the real dilemmas from uh, the people who are facing these problems and discuss these uh, in computer science courses. And say you're doing a, a say you have a machine learning course, you don't need to talk about uh, you know you don't need to have the big ethics lecture there. But what you can do is have a session, maybe at the end, maybe near the end, where instead of uh, you know, student presentations on the new solution, um, um, whatever the technical thing may be, you. Um, have a discussion on different case studies and you let the students present their ideas. Uh, and I think that's a good way to sort of reflect on your own assumptions as a community. Um, yeah, we'll leave it there. Super quick. Yeah, I, I just wanted to go back to the uh, to, to one of Nick's comments on the importance of uh, principles-based approach and uh, potential feedback from the community. So Nick, Nick mentioned this term, uh, the underground economy on the internet. And I just wanted to elaborate on that because I think it has a lot of uh, potential depth and a wealth of uh, ethics-related challenges. And it's also something very unique to this panel because we're discussing in the section of security and ethics. So we have real adversaries on the internet, right? So Nick mentioned this example of uh, some networks that are doing censorship. But even beyond censorship, we have adversaries that are actively doing bad things on the internet. So one example that comes to mind from my research at Princeton is the spread of fake accounts on social networks. So the adversaries that are simply generating millions and millions of fake accounts in networks like Facebook and Twitter and using them for nefarious purposes, including spreading misinformation in, uh, in elections, for example. So as, as, uh, as computer security researchers, we have strong interest in studying and measuring these attackers. So what are the ethics of, of dealing with, with real attackers? We, we actually want to engage with them, pay them money, and buy these fake accounts so we can study these properties. Is that human subjects research, or maybe these are fake accounts, so maybe it's OK? <laughs> But how do we know that they're truly fake accounts? Maybe you know, some might be compromised accounts, so they're real accounts. It's just that the adversary has access to their, uh, to their passwords. So how do, how do we think about uh, these types of scenarios? OK, uh, turn it out to the audience. Uh, even microphone Hi, coming around. Hi, uh, thank you so much. That was really insightful and uh, informative. So I have this feeling that it's becoming an and to point uh, what Ben was mentioned, it's very cool to talk about ethics in general, and people buy your beer and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually really good that we don't talk about ethics. But I, to me, somehow, it feels like almost a symptom of a bigger problem that we have in academia. And obviously, we can add ethics to everything we do. We just say, look, I'm doing privacy, so I'm now doing privacy and ethics. So let's talk about that. But I wonder if, you know, to, to the panelists, you professors, and if a student comes to you and says, well, I cannot submit this work to this deadline because there, there's a deadline, because I have to reflect on it on the ethical consideration, so I'll come back to you in three weeks because I have to re really reflect on that. That's a philosophical question that I have to answer. Would you agree on that, and what would be your reaction? Because I think today, specifically in computer science, I can talk directly to the cycle of publications and driven is really uh, putting a lot of pressure uh, on researchers to actually come up with shortcuts and invite Ben for beer and ask how we do this. <laughs> Sorry, Ben, I'm not trying to it. Yeah, just basically, I think it's almost, we have to see a bigger picture, maybe look, uh, focus on fundamental problems, see how we can solve them that way. That, that's, that's why I advocate this iterative approach, that you know, even if the cycle is very, you know, if you're very pressured, you can try and come up with solutions, you can try and show, you know, we, we did think about it in this and this way, and if then the PC says, you know, maybe you should look at the database, uh, because in 2014, for example, we've covered this problem and the, the solution was such and such, so you can go back and forth. Um, so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think the pressure is necessarily the, the, the problem there. I think as long as you can go back and forth uh, and discuss... But you cannot, there is a pressure, right? You well, that's... You no, no, but once you've submitted, you can oh. go back and forth in that particular, that, that should be, I think, the standard for uh, conferences, rather than, you know, because of pressure you didn't think about the ethics angle, uh, and then get rejected. Yeah, I think th these are challenges that, that we face on an ongoing basis, especially with, with students who are new, new to security and, and, and privacy. 
Uh, so in fact, we're currently working on a measurement study where we want to trick certificate authorities into giving us certificates for domains that we might not technically control. Uh, so we were able to figure out uh, some ways of bypassing the ethical conundrums. Uh, but, you know, just yesterday I got an email from an undergrad student with you know, the, the, the new challenges, the deadline is on Monday. Uh, so clearly, I mean, this, this, this has to be ingrained uh, in, our, in our discussions with students from the, uh, from the get-go. I think one thing that, uh, that, that we always try to tell students in general is, is to start early. And uh, that often does not bear itself out. <laughs> um, you know, writing a paper two seconds before the deadline rarely ends well. But uh, especially in the case where you have to consider ethics, I think the, you know, in incredibly important to, to start early. Uh, it, I think it's worth noting that the National Science Foundation now in when, whenever uh, a PI submits a grant proposal, uh, they ask for a data management plan, and part of that basically involves, how, you know, what kind of data are you, are you collecting? How are you basically going to store that data, protect it, et cetera? That's obviously not the full story, but I could see a, an arc there that basically heads in this direction. I think we basically need to be considering these questions way upstream, not, oh, I thought of this now, and there's this paper deadline in two weeks. Can I submit the paper? I think the answer probably should be no, um, uh, for, and not just for ethics reasons. Um, so I think, uh, why do you start early? I think because the approach should be iterative, right? There are no easy answers here often. In fact, there's, I think, Ben, I liked your comment, how do I make this ethical, right? I mean, I, I, it's not like, a, oh, I'll just work, you know, extra hard this weekend, we'll take a <laughs> few more boxes, and then we'll, it'll be ethical. I mean, it, it often is a, is a, is a process. So I, I think that's uh, probably the best thing to do is start early. There's one other comment I wanted to make on, on that um, because you were talking about, you know, basically as, you know, students, researchers, postdocs, um, et cetera. I think as a community, um, it's, Im it's imperative that we, that we shift the norms. And I don't just mean the norms of ethics. I mean the norms of talking about ethics. Um, it should be okay to to have these discussions, to talk about ethics. I think because this is relatively new, uh, there's, there can be a fairly knee-jerk reaction uh, among the technical program committee, reviewers, et cetera. Oh, there's an ethical issue here. This must be bad, right? And I think basically there are an increasing number of, of topics where if you're, if you're doing interesting work, there are going to be ethical issues. So I think we need to shift the norms in terms of just having ethics discussions, that it should be part of the norm to have this iterative approach. If there are ethical concerns, um, there shouldn't be chilling effects, right? And, and there's a real risk of chilling effects on both sides, right? Uh, going back to the comment my student made, there's a potential chilling effect where researchers know about ethical issues, but they're afraid to raise them because, you know, they, they don't want to be raked across the coals or have their paper rejected. On the other side, there might be, uh, you know, there might be other chilling effects where researchers just simply don't do the research because they're afraid that they're going to get in trouble. And we can't have that, but in order to avoid those kinds of situations, we have to have the dialogue and the iterative approach so that a researcher feels comfortable saying, I'm thinking of doing this, and, um, and by the way, I'm not going to submit the paper in two weeks and the work is done already, what do you think? It's, I'm thinking of doing this. Um, you know, what are, the, what are the issues? And then the types of questions that I think Ben raised, what, what are you trying to achieve, what, you know, and, and how do you get there? Uh, we can actually have those dialogues. Um, similar ethical issues should probably be uh, of some concern to researchers in outside of academia. Because, um, for example, the recent FCC ruling that enables uh, ISPs to use data, how, how, I mean, how, how, is, how do you address that kind of situation? How should Google use that data? Should we impose any norms on how they use our data? Well, so let me perhaps phrase that in a, in a way that sort of emerges with the stuff we discussed today, which is, I think uh, as 
uh, Arvind or Matt, one of you mentioned, there's a blurring line between corporate and academic research at this point. How, how do you think there's a balance to that? Should they be approached differently? And how do people deal with those conflicts? Yes. Sorry. Other big bad I, I, people government. Yeah. I think one, one really important thing is to understand that uh, the, the people that are being educated in, at conferences and, and in uh, master's programs or whatever will often also work at these large firms. So giving them an ethical framework as they're learning the, the, you know, the tools of the trade will en enable them to have the discussions when they are at the companies or at the regulators uh, and, and allow them to e express why they don't think a certain action is good or bad. And I've seen, uh, I've been in San Francisco a lot recently and I've seen young engineers come to me and tell me that I don't know how to say this to my boss, but you know, give me the tools. So I think that the, the ability to reflect and this is not quite answering your question, but it's, I think it's part of it. Um, and I think the other part on, uh, you know, yeah, companies are definitely in, within a different ethical framework from, from researchers. The, the, their main interest is, is shareholders often and, and, and user trust, but that, that's less strong as academic research. Um, but I do think, you know, academics also need to be aware that the precedents they set will often also be used in, in companies. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if uh, we've, we, we've heard it before, I won't mention names, but one of the tests that ethical and, and privacy groups at big companies often do is, you know, not necessarily what is the law, but what is the precedent in the field. Mm -hmm. And that can be mm -hmm. the other company or it can be uh, a research paper. Um, so I think, yeah, we, we, quite, we have quite a, responsibility there to set the right precedents. Yeah, I think, I think this is a really interesting question uh, in terms of uh, uh, ethics for corporate researchers and potential differences with academic research. Uh, I think, of course, there are interesting legal questions as well. That, you know, is, is, this, is this allowable, but getting past the legal question. First, I want to point out that there's tremendous scientific opportunity there because it's very difficult for academic researchers to get access to data at Google and data at Facebook and data at AT&T. So there are some, there's some really interesting scientific questions that uh, the research teams, in particular the security and privacy research teams at Google and Facebook can answer that many of us in this room cannot, cannot answer. Uh, and of course, then you know, that has some potential for, for abuse. Uh, I think one example that comes to mind is uh, some research that happened at Facebook in terms of uh, uh, changing the uh, timeline of, uh, of, some, uh, of some Facebook posts and doing some alpha beta tests with respect to that. And we saw the tremendous negative reaction uh, from the community against, uh, against that type of research. So hopefully there are some social feedback loops to, uh, to, to, to keep some uh, checks and balances in place, even when things are legal. Just to add a little bit to, to your question, I think there, as researchers, I'll, I'll speak as a, as a university researcher a little bit, as Pratik was saying, there are uh, strong benefits to collaborating with industry, with government, with the media, et cetera. They often bring uh, relevant context, uh, data, uh, often a chance for tech transfer or impact, exposure. Um, and then I think on the flip side, as, as computer scientists, we, we have a secret weapon, which is technical knowledge of how things actually work. <laughs> um, as academic researchers, we have the ability to think creatively and independently. Uh, we don't have quarterly reports or shareholders. And we, so that basically gives us the ability to think independently and long term. So from the perspective of being approached, from industry, government, the media, et cetera, uh, you know, we are attractive targets. Um, everybody has their agenda, um, you know, um, and because we have the secret weapon, everybody wants us to fight their battle, right? So you have someone from industry, someone from the regulator, someone from the media, they have a point they'd like to make, they have an agenda, and they view the academics as ripe targets because we can be viewed as plain dealers, right? Um, and I think that's where we have to be really careful, right? Uh, on the one hand, uh, this collaboration can be incredibly fruitful because we can have the data that we otherwise couldn't have. We can have the relevance that we can't otherwise have. But um, we have to avoid this Faustian 
bargain all the time, right? One of the main advantages of being an academic researcher is that you can be viewed as a plain dealer. And that's very precious and it's easily lost. So I think we have to make really conscious decisions about what we do before we, before we enter the fray. So I think the main question there is, you know, how can we be relevant to these parties without being captured? And I, I, you know, having thought about that myself a little bit, I think uh, I have a couple principles there. I mean, one is to always consider the inputs from, from multiple stakeholders and, and bring them to the table in your discussion, right? So you know, to, to consider your case, right? Uh, the, the example you brought up. Um, what are the consumer advocates saying? Um, what are the merits of that argument? What are the ISPs saying? What, what are the merits of those arguments? What are the content providers saying, right? Because remember, this is not just the dyad. There are other, there are other factors at play. And, and what are the merits of those arguments? And by the way, as again, keeping in mind that our expertise is technical, right? So what can we bring to the table that, that, that colors that discussion in important ways? So that's the first, is, is to really kind of consider multiple stakeholders before, you know, uh, before deciding to enter the fray. And I think the second is uh, to, to have your own moral compass and to be very clear on what your own values are and what you think about an issue or a, or a problem before you're approached, right? So you need to be able to think critically because the masses will speak and they will speak loudly and there will be other voices as well. Uh, many of these discussions are not nuanced, right? And uh, as, again, as, as academics, uh, you know, the, the worst thing I think we, we could do is to basically just, you know, shout with the masses because we're not using our, our, our levers, right? So we should be bringing our skills, our data, and our findings in ways that can, can really shape and, and, and change these debates. And I think, you know, again, there's, there's a moral and ethical aspect to that, which is that, um, you know, what we say or the data that we bring can tilt a discussion, right? So we have to decide basically, you know, when we want to, you know, when we want to step in and help shape those outcomes. That is so awesome what you just said. I'm afraid to ask my boring question. <laughs> I, I really, really, I just love it. Um, so my boring, I will ask my boring question unless you want to just close me. <laughs> All right. uh, the, uh, but because it was a nit to pick with something you were saying uh, uh, three questions ago, which was about the um, the value of the ethics sections on the papers. So in in uh, animal behavior, uh, they now several of the journals, I think including animal behavior, the journal, uh, require that you have an ethics statement. And as a as a modeler, I I always put in a line that says something like. Yeah, no animals were affected at all, but this data, this research couldn't have been done without empirical data as well, and I fully support my, my animal science colleagues because of the, some of the controversies that come up in the UK. I'm always careful to align like that. Yeah. I think yeah. it's really important yeah. that um, I understand why you want to have a full discussion, but again, I'm worried about the chilling, the chilling aspect, or maybe yeah. you weren't fully really inclined. I think having these positive exemplars in there, even if they're short statements, is really useful. Can I say just a word on that? Um, I, I, I agree with you, actually. So um, I wasn't trying to suggest that we shouldn't have those sections. Quite the contrary, right? That the section itself should not be a throwaway, but rather be, be based on principles. So, so as an anecdote, I actually had a long, uh, fairly drawn out discussion with a co-author on a recent paper that we did on DNS censorship. And he found our ethics section um, I actually basically, uh, I guess, invoked your, your methods, Matt, and uh, he said, I, I don't think we should really get into all these details. And I said, well, actually, I, th I think we should because this is the kind of discussion we should be having. We shouldn't have the throwaway paragraph that said, oh, we think it's okay because that's just going to continue our high-level gut-based discussions. And even though, yes, we lost... Uh, you know, three quarters of a column where we could have put more technical stuff in there. I, I think it's important to have that. So hopefully that clears up the point. And I, to add to that, you can uh, also refer to a longer ethics statement that you have somewhere else. I've seen that in a few papers now that you, you, you explain the basics in 10 sentences and then you have a footnote that says, you know, and here's a link to our four page ethics consideration document. 
uh, which works just as well, I think. Uh, just, just, to, just to complete yeah. the loop and, and deal with the chilling effect, maybe this section should be a, not an optional section, but a required section. Yes. So if you don't have this, then that, that would be a problem. And one could imagine norms establishing about in terms of what that includes and how cursory that is, in ter or you know, leaving some questions open, saying we did this, we welcome feedback, or something like that. And just to speak as a lawyer, um, what I often tell people who are trying to do research or who are trying to use data in their companies is think about the long-term point of view. You know, if you do something uh, and it is seen as unethical on the broad scale, granted, it's not a nuanced conversation often, but you know, you risk having your future efforts really tarnished. Mm -hmm. And few people, I think, recover from that kind of uh, reputational damage as well. I'm going to briefly abuse my privileges to kind of ring around with the mic to slip in a question for Ben primarily. So you've been embedded with the security community, with the measurement community. And I think these communities have benefited tremendously from your involvement, and I certainly have myself. And I think that's great. That's a form of outsider involvement. Maybe it's not as awesome, Matt, as having a minister on the IRB, but <laughs> it's still pretty good. It's the next best thing. But what, what, what is the incentive for people like you? How can we incentivize future bands to yeah. do the kind of work that you've done? Because what you've done is still pretty unusual. I don't think it's been replicated in a lot of other scenarios. Mm -hmm. OK, um, the obvious answer is buy me beers. And <laughs> <laughs> make I me feel like know it. what to do now. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I think. Um, I, th I think that's really difficult. I think, uh, so I, I was actually encouraged to do this. Uh, I, I criticized people at a, the research arm at, at a tech company. I, I criticized them what they were doing. I, I wanted their money, <laughs> uh, but I didn't want to like add my name to research in the way that they were doing it because that was just unethical and that's not how I was going to do it. And they then said, um, oh, we hadn't thought of it in that way. Can you write a guideline for us? And then we can distribute that to researchers that use this particular system. And that got me embedded in these communities uh, because I had to find out how to do this. Um, so it's not, an, an, it's not a natural thing for a lawyer or you know, anyone who's from the other side to just walk into a computer science conference and, and you know, give your opinion. Actually, I, I went to many, many computer science conferences, and the first 15 were highly confusing. <laughs> uh, so um, I don't know, th th there are people that are doing it. Re last year, Christine Solon, Barakas, and I were in Germany for a week with 37 computer scientists at Dagstuhl. Uh, that was incredibly interesting. Uh, they, they kept asking for our opinions. Um, long story, what they were doing, it was database uh, re research community. But th th you know, th those kinds of things, like inviting people to come to your conference and actually make them feel welcome and, and make their opinions feel welcome. Give them a, a stage to talk. You know, first time I talked for five minutes, then 15, and before I knew it, I was giving talks of an hour and, and more. So you know, give them the confidence that they're actually being heard and um, work with them as well, uh, especially on the textual side, you know, write up the case studies, write up the blog posts with them. Uh, yeah, and, and make them feel a bit more confident in what they're doing because it's, it's quite daunting at first, I'm sure you can imagine. Yeah, I will, I will support that as someone who is often the bad news human on the side, um, which is invite us. Um, try not to make us feel like the enemy. Um, but like actually just include us in the real conversation, and I think as, as is here, in a way that makes it seem like we are part of a conversation, not that we're just a checkbox. And I suppose have hopefully some sympathy for us in the sense that we're not doing, you know, I, I said, you know, we're not doing this because we don't trust you or think, you know, research, these researchers, you have bad intentions. It's just a matter of different kinds of expertise. Yeah, sure. So, one question about ethics is that there's kind of sometimes an assumption that ethics are homogenous or that different value systems are reconcilable. Um, what you start finding is that sometimes questions about ethics are also questions about power um, and how society can kind of work. Um, and a good example could be research on security vulnerabilities. So white hat hackers were brought up. There's good examples of white hat hackers you know, exploring technologies um, and finding vulnerabilities, but then when they try to report these to the public or to companies in general, they're actually pressed with legal action because it does tarnish the company's brand. But then sometimes in an academic setting, you know, it's allowed. Um, et 
said, not always. Sometimes there's a question of how tenure can work, your credit processes, distribution of funding. So it's kind of a game that an academic has to play about what they should or shouldn't speak. Um, what is perceived as ethical is also a question of what power relations there are. Um, how do you go about considering this or exploring this convention? Easy question, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, stakeholder analyses, I think. Uh, often you'll be the person in power because if you're creating an app or a tech or a platform or if you're initiating information flows, collecting data, you're in power. Uh, and as we said earlier, you know, sometimes there's millions of people who have no idea that you have power over them. Uh, so really understand the, the context within which these stakeholders operate, uh, show what the, the, these, or understand what an adversary who would maybe and, you know, intercept this information or get a leaked copy of it, understand what they would see, you know, what, what new information are you creating, um, what, what could be the, the, the detrimental effects of that for particular data subjects. And the way to do that is to you know, not use your East Coast US mindset while collecting data in India, but actually speak to your peers in India and maybe show them like a sample database and say, you know, here are 10 records of the million that we're going to collect is this a problem for India, for example? Um, so it's, it's, I mean, it's a difficult thing, but it's, it's, yeah, I think ethics really comes from power. Uh, and especially if you're shifting power relations, uh, if you're setting up blockchain things, for example, where decentralization is a big thing. Yeah, it's, uh, you have to do a diligent stakeholder analysis, I think. Yeah, I think, great, great, great question. Um, I have more questions in my mind as a follow-up to that that answers but what one, one one issue that uh, I was thinking of uh, based on your question of you know, heterogeneity of ethics it reminded me of heterogeneity of, of privacy policies as well uh, so for example if you think about certain types of data like say location data uh, maybe it's okay for a privacy technology to make my location trace indistinguishable from say you know Nick's trace or Ben's trace or or Arvin's trace and uh, I have some I have some privacy with respect to the Princeton community or, to, or the broader New Jersey community uh, but let, let's see what happens if you apply the same principle to, say, a, a Tor user, and if you make uh, a Tor user's traffic uh, essentially indistinguishable from other Tor users, sure, the user has anonymity, but we haven't managed to hide the fact that the user is still a Tor user, right? In many repressive regimes, uh, just the fact that you are a user of uh, a censorship circumvention tool could be uh, potentially quite damaging. 